Before we start, uh, let me introduce myself. So my name is Michael Watson. I'm a developer advocate at Apollo. Um, we're a company that builds tools around GraphQL, helps enterprises with really GraphQL um, and everything around it. Um, so easy for me to say, I'm obsessed with GraphQL. I've been working in this space for about six years. Um, I kind of do everything GraphQL first at this point in my life. Um, I'm a big believer in the technology and I can geek out about every aspect of it. So my goal today is really to convince you all when you walk away that GraphQL does make your APIs better. I, I'm taking a bold statement there, right? Like there's a lot of different things we can use to build uh, the various like, digital experiences we're creating out there. And I'm a firm believer when you choose GraphQL as one of those standards of how you build those digital experiences, it really does make your APIs better. Things get a lot easier and a lot of things that uh, seem really hard start to become very easy. And of course, there's a little learning curve, but um, I want to take you through that journey. Um, but before we get into it, let's actually talk about what GraphQL is. How many people in the room have used GraphQL? Okay, cool. All right. I love to see that. So one of the things I want to get a quick misconception out there, I hear this a lot, um, GraphQL, it's not a database. You know, a lot of times we think of it like, oh, well, it's like SQL or something like that. Uh, GraphQL is a query language at its heart. And you know, the concept of graph, you know, a lot of times we think of vector databases, vectors, all of this. GraphQL is really just a specification that defines what the query language is. So there's actually a spec that backs GraphQL. This is the most recent version. There is a one that's currently in the work. Um, this was, GraphQL was created by Facebook. So how Facebook worked, you know, the Facebook graph, that website, the back end, what it talks to, all of that was done through GraphQL. Um, in 2015, Facebook open sourced what GraphQL is and that, what that spec is. And actually, GraphQL is part of the Linux Foundation. So in 2019, Facebook donated all of that IP, the GraphQL spec, to the Linux Foundation. There's a working group behind it. They have regular meetings. There's a lots of stuff going in there. But the main thing I want you to know about is GraphQL has been out there for a while. It's kind of already gone through the levels of maturity. It's got a lot of adoption across the enterprises. It's not something to think like it's a cool new shiny toy. It's been battle tested and it's been out there for a while. Um, there is the GraphQL Foundation. So if you went to the Linux Foundation's website, looked at their projects, you'll see GraphQL on there. Um, you know, they have a whole mission about it. Um, but I think, you know, coming from a Linux Foundation, it's, it's important to note that. Um, so I like to break GraphQL down into three simple categories. They have these three things defined in GraphQL, queries, mutations, and subscriptions. And I just like to simply think of it as querying is fetching data. I'm getting some data. Mutation, I'm trying to change some data. I'm trying to create something, something around state usually. And then subscriptions, which is about real-time data. So how are we streaming data? Um, so GraphQL is kind of broken into these three distinct operations in there. And GraphQL is all based on a strongly typed schema. So over here on the right, we actually have a schema um, for a little Spotify app that I'm going to be showing in a minute. Um, but that schema, I like to think of it as your contract. Really, that's what your digital representation of your product is. So a lot of times we start building our APIs. We have these REST APIs. You know, we think about the microservices and, and we start going down this path where we start thinking, well, we need these discoverability tools to find out what APIs do I need to do this thing? Our omni-channel strategy, right? But really what it comes down to is like, what is the product experience behind that digital aspect, which is your API, right? A REST API, you have a bunch of things that are all kind of put together. The, the magic behind GraphQL is being able to represent that schema, that experience you want to have for your digital APIs, and that helps power what your omni-channel strategy is, right? If I want to do this thing with something in my graph, that should be something available to all the platforms that I'm building a digital experience on, whether that's mobile, web, some you know, CLI experience. Um, all the way to, let's say, uh, Wayfair. They have a little kiosk that you can drop items off for a return and it scans a barcode. That uses the graph as well, right? It's applications that are consuming the graph. And that leads us to really what is that product mindset? And that's one of the powers that GraphQL really shifts is you start thinking about your product as this platform in this digital space. And of course, 
client developers love it because it's just one place to get what they need, right? You can now have client developers that can move around in the organization because once you understand how to get data with GraphQL, you can kind of do that everywhere, right? And one of the magic value points that was always sold about GraphQL is client developers just select what fields they want for the operation, right? So this whole concept of overfetching and underfetching of a JSON response coming back from your API, you kind of get to now select what are the things that I actually want to be part of that response. Um, that's cool, but I think there's a lot more to GraphQL that uh, is much more interesting that I'm going to hopefully convince you all of why it's better. Um, you'll also hear a lot of conversation of REST versus GraphQL, all these things. Um, they're all complementary technologies, right? We should always be using the right technology for the right job. Um, GraphQL is actually just REST. Really, it's kind of a simplification of the REST semantic. Um, so this is actually a curl request for a GraphQL operation. You can see we have a post. So it's just a post request to a GraphQL endpoint. And inside of the body, you can see a query. And that's actually the shape of that operation. Right? So by default, GraphQL requests are just post requests. And that body of that request is what contains that GraphQL operation. There's also the concept of persisted queries. Persisted queries is where we're actually taking that GraphQL operation, we're turning it into a GET request, and we're basically creating a hashed ID based off of whatever that shape of that operation body is. This was created so we can do things like CDN caching behind GraphQL APIs. Right? But that's kind of the whole you know, map of what GraphQL is. You have POST requests and you have GET requests. And they're kind of in these two form factors. Now, there's a lot more I can go into about just GraphQL. This is just the surface I'm going to get into of like, what GraphQL is. Um, there's a lot of great resources out there. Uh, if, you know, coming from the Linux community, if you're into like 12 factor app and that was a world you came from, um, there's a website we created, Principled GraphQL, that really talks and, and is actually designed off of 12 factor app of the principles behind GraphQL, the concept of one graph, lots of great stuff there. GraphQL.com. Um, we have some tutorials with certifications that are all free online, really great tutorials um, that I'd recommend learning. Of course, our docs. And I linked in here this little open source repo um, that I'm going to be showing some stuff from, just in case you wanted to learn. It's a great example of a full stack application, uh, client and backend wrapped in there. Um, with that said, I'm going to do some demo stuff today, too, because I thought that would be a little fun. So, GraphQL, let's, let's actually just quickly look at, you know, why do client developers love it? And what does it actually mean to, like, interact with a GraphQL API? Um, now, for our demo purposes today, I mentioned that there was that little repo. What we've done is we've actually recreated the Spotify website, desktop uh, clone app experience. That was a really weird way to say that. We recreated their website. Um, and this is just an example built on top of all of Spotify's REST APIs. So this is actually open.spotify.com. This is what uh, their actual website looks like. And this is the React application we created along with that. So I'm actually logging in right now. This is all through the OAuth uh, uh, path that's part of Spotify's documentation. And, and this is the app that we created. So you can see there's a lot of, it's, it's a very similar look and feel inside of there, right? So I, the first thing I want to say is when we start thinking about the digital experiences, that modern application that we're delivering out there, you know, in the most common form right now in the website world, right, we have a React application. It's probably uh, supporting things like suspense, a lot of the nice modern aspects of, of, you know, how a page loads. You know, even when you saw this kind of load up, you saw some things show up as little boxes and then the data loads in. So being able to dynamically load things together, right? And this all kind of plays into that experience of what we're putting together. Um, but backing this application is just a GraphQL endpoint. So all the requests this app's making is all through GraphQL. Um, now what I have up on the screen is called Apollo Explorer. Uh, there's a lot of form factors of this. Uh, one of the other projects out there, Graphical, um, there's also GraphQL uh, Playground, GraphQL Playground, I blank, blanked on that word. Um, but they're basically little IDEs that give you a viewpoint into your graph and being able to query or execute data across that. Um, so inside of here, I have a, a couple things. Um, you know, right now, uh, I have in the background um, Spotify playing. 
have a little speaker playing. You can kind of hear some music going on. Hopefully this isn't too disorienting for the uh, video. But as a developer, I should be able to look in my graph, figure out the things I need to do, and execute those operations. So you can actually see I just execute an operation through my GraphQL portal, and that stopped the music that was playing from Spotify. Notice the little Spotify play bar at the bottom? That's the Spotify desktop app, right? Well, we can go back and we can resume that playback. And notice the Spotify desktop app is also playing now, right? So all of these things are, are coming together. When I'm talking about that omni-channel experience, let me pause this. What I'm really talking about is when you build your API, you're going to have multiple clients that are going to be consuming it, multiple aspects that are all coming together. GraphQL is a great, great technology to use for this world because we can create a contract, which is our schema, between what the clients need from what is that product experience, right? When you think of a product manager that's actually helping build, like, the website, these aspects, well, like, how do you actually want your graph to be consumed? When you think of your REST API, you have these distinct endpoints, and you kind of just tell the developers, like, here's the stuff you need, and they start figuring out, okay, I need to go to this endpoint to get this, and then do this, and do that. And this now becomes handwritten code, right? Back end for front end, whatever you want to call the flavor of the API you end up creating, but you end up writing some handwritten code inside of there. That's where bugs get introduced. We, you know, start thinking of how do we get resilience in there because there could be failovers from downtime, from someone shipping, some, all these things that start coming into play. Now, GraphQL doesn't make any of that just disappear, but it does kind of change the shape of things. So, you know, there's a lot more I can go into as the client experience of, you know, now that I have a schema, I can quickly start to explore, like, okay, I want to do something with inside of me, you know, with my profile, I want to find all of my followers, and start track going down the tree and getting into the data that I need. And that's kind of the, the consuming side of GraphQL. But, you know, how do we even get into the world of, like, wanting GraphQL? And let's talk about that for a second. So I mentioned GraphQL makes your APIs better. And one of the things you might have today is like, okay, we, we, we might have a bunch of APIs, or we might have a bunch of data sources that are kind of in this world, and maybe you want to start modernizing your application. One option you have is just kind of layering GraphQL onto your current APIs, and that's going to just make them better. So the first thing you're going to get, if you just layered GraphQL over your current APIs today, you're going to get a better observability story. You're going to get the API usage. You saw those shapes of those operations we were just executing, right? The mutation that paused the music, the mutation that resumed the music. Those shapes of operation are actually intent of how our graphs are being used, right? So when you start thinking of like, all right, we're going to introduce this new feature that's going to be used on this website. Well, with that new feature is a distinct operation that is going to be executed on your graph. And this actually gives you understanding of what's the usage of your graph. Right? When you have a bunch of different REST API points, you kind of let your client developers have at it and you know, figure things out. It works, but you lose some of that usage. Right? It gets really hard for us to now to string together what were all those operations in the succinct order, meaning I have maybe five screens in a workflow for my application. Right? As I progress through those string screens, what were the API calls that happened? Were one of those points maybe a friction point where we saw a drop off from screen two to screen three of users? This is observability you start getting from GraphQL because of those operation shapes, right? What is the intent of using the graph? Faster application delivery. Hands down, this is easily one of the things I see most. The enterprises that I work with, when I'm first talking with them, they're talking about you know, how they ship updates maybe every two weeks. Maybe they have some cycle that they go on. And they end up getting to the point where they're shipping you know, multiple updates daily. You know, when an update is ready, getting that to production now. Um, a lot of the companies I talk with, all we talk about is how do we get a subgraph, a new GraphQL API to production in the most self-service manner possible. And GraphQL does offer an architecture that lets you do that. So if you're not shipping you know, multiple updates a day, that is actually the world once you get into GraphQL of, of where you get to. You know, once you get to that V1, the V next that comes along, starts happening really quickly. 
Um, it makes things easier now that you have a contract between the client developers and the back-end developers where they can work independently. This also helps with that uh, faster application delivery. And then third, there's a lot of capabilities you just get out of the box if you switch, if you put GraphQL over your existing APIs. Um, real time, everything around subscriptions, that becomes a pattern now that can empower all of your client developers. Defer, there's advanced things in the GraphQL spec that help your client developers. We'll talk about progressively, progressively loading some views and how at defer can help there. And query planning, that little handwritten code I was talking about of having to orchestrate multiple API calls in a GraphQL architecture with microservices, you can actually have query planning where you can actually have an intelligent query plan designed based off what operation's coming in. So we're not writing handwritten code of go to this API, that API, this API. Now, we all kind of start out with this initial dream, right? Where maybe as we start out this idea, you know, we have our little website, we have our API, everything's great. You know, maybe this is just like some simple mono repo we start getting it out there, it starts becoming successful. So then all of a sudden, oh, we need a mobile app now. You know, things are going along great. But something about that original API, the mobile team's like, no, that's not good enough. We, we need some special things for ourselves. We, we can use your stuff for like some of the things, but then we also need these bespoke endpoints, right? And so they start to build their own API. Right? And maybe they have their API talk to your API, and you kind of now have this back end for front end world that's started to evolve. And what happens about vNext? You know, we have things like AI. People are talking about how are we bringing LLMs into our APIs to you know, power a new modern experience. I'm talking about that internally at Apollo. I mean, I know every enterprise I've been talking with, they pretty much aren't doing any initiatives or funding any initiatives unless there's some AI component to it right now which that's just kind of the reality we're in right now, right? So what are you gonna do about that next thing that comes out, right? And this is where GraphQL provides an architecture uh, that allows us to bring in these new things uh, easily. So what we've seen proven at scale is an architecture where you have a graph router that is able to route to multiple GraphQL APIs with inside of your organization. When you think about platform teams and they have APIs that they offer as a a service to the uh, internal developers at an organization, um, really the, the change there is to start offering those as GraphQL representations, right? We own the product domain of our uh, enterprise and now we have a GraphQL offering for that. Um, and the graph router is what's able to understand what are all these distinct GraphQL APIs within the organization and then understand based on an incoming operation what APIs do I need to interact with to get that data to fulfill this request, right? And so that's what that graph router does. So it's a really important piece of that architecture, right? And so this graph router is really kind of sitting in between uh, our services and our applications, and it's all through that contract, which is our schema, right? So we mentioned observability. This is one of the opportunities we have is by having this architecture, we can have observability at that top layer. It also provides GraphQL for all. And what I mean by that is anyone can write a query. You know, it may be a new thing at first, but honestly, anyone can write a query. I mean, if Homer Simpson was around today, query writing champ, no problem. Anyone can write a GraphQL query. And I think that's one of the benefits of GraphQL. You know, if I think about REST APIs and, you know, I gotta use Postman and trying to get into that, that works for me as a developer. But then when I'm talking with PM or PMM or someone from another part of the organization, they don't have those tools or they don't do those workflows necessarily. With GraphQL, this is now a portal that enables everyone. Anyone can write a query and you can even share an operation with someone. Here's how I get this data from the graph. Mentioned there's real-time aspects that now, because it's just GraphQL for everyone, once you start putting subscriptions on your graph, that's now capabilities for everyone. Right? We're no longer thinking, okay, how are we gonna put this streaming thing into our website? Okay, well, what are we trying to stream with our product and how do we make that available to where that can be consumed into all of our clients? So the more efficient query execution, that router is able to plan based off of what uh, uh, items are in there. And more specifically, there's some great opportunities in here for caching 
uh, when you start thinking about, I have distinct APIs. I mean, most of the time when I talk with teams, the, one of the big naysayers of, I don't want to move from REST to GraphQL, is because we put so much investment in our REST API. We have all the caching things built into it. It's all there. Um, the best part about GraphQL is you can just bring that all along. There's actually a lot of great opportunities to use that caching. Um, in Apollo Server and a lot of the GraphQL libraries, um, there's things like at cache control, which is a directive that allows you to have cache semantic hints that could be sent to your downstream services. So if you had, for example, you know, certain standards you're using for your caching at your REST API, you can actually have those uh, trickle down as part of your data source and just be used in your graph. Right? So you don't need to get rid of existing investments to start taking a step forward with GraphQL. And then, of course, security built in. Everyone just says that, right? Security's just built in. You don't got to worry about it. But we're actually going to talk a little bit more about this, the security aspects. One of the benefits of this architecture is you have the opportunity as an organization to have security all integrated into one place to where now all of your developers are in line in using that. Right, and this is where when you start integrating like authentication, authorization into your graph, now all the developers get to take advantage of this, right? And this is where internal platform teams with developer portals have become really common in adopting GraphQL. Um, and then yeah, this architecture, battle tested, free to run, you know, all the GraphQL server libraries are all open source, all that type of stuff. Now you may be thinking, okay, all right, I want to try out some GraphQL. What's the first thing I got to do? Well, no matter what, you could use, there's managed services out there that can create a GraphQL API off of like an open API definition. There's GraphQL servers out there. No matter what fidelity you're at, you're eventually going to mature to a point where you want to build a GraphQL server, right? You may start out with some of these auto-gen solutions, but as you mature, as I've seen the adoption grow with GraphQL, you typically get to a point where you end up wanting to write a GraphQL server. Specifically, GraphQL server in your language, right? A lot of times people see GraphQL, they think JavaScript, TypeScript, that's what I gotta use, but that's not the case. Actually, for the backend world, that's, that's not the most common. Probably the most common is more in like Java, Kotlin. Um, .NET's really popular out there, uh, but Java, Kotlin is definitely one of the more popular ones out there. Um, my team, we put a templating solution in our Rover CLI. These are just a bunch of GitHub repos of subgraph GraphQL API libraries that you can start up with. Um, and it kind of has a lot of things bootstrapped in there. It's got a Docker file, a simple schema that's implemented. You should be able to run them all just from the clone. Uh, there's also some tests inside of there. So this is a great one. Uh, Java, I put Spring Boot up there for this community out there, but there's .NET with hot chocolate inside of there. So these are great resources to get started with in building out a new GraphQL API. Now, <clears throat> when we start thinking about like building a new GraphQL API, one of the things that, I, I don't know, I, I feel like this is everywhere now, platform engineering. Everyone's getting into platform engineering. Even the, the meta book or booth today, uh, they have, they call it a production engineering was the group they're calling it, right? But it's basically a team of developers that are supporting all the developers internally to build things internally, right? And it's this platform mindset that has really started to take over, right? So let's tell a little story here. You know, once upon a time, there was developers and there was ops. Right? And they kind of were in their separate worlds. Everything was great. But then there'd sometimes be some challenges, right? And there was this, this desire, what, what do we do as an industry? DevOps, let's put them together. Let's slap them together. They have to start working together. They have to put their flows together. And, you know, some nice things started happening, CI, CD. But then everyone was like, oh, we need, we need better reliability. Things are falling over, failing. Let's get some you know, site reliability engineers in there, right? So we had SREs inside of there. Ah, then security, you know, security is always, always one of those things. So let's add security in there, right? And it keeps growing. And then now we're hearing all these new things, like cost management, you know, sustainability, FinOps, right? So then we got this new thing that's going to be coming out, right? But really, all of this is just platform. Right? It's what are all the things 
does a developer need for our organization to be supported from creating a new thing and getting it to production, right? If you think about from the executives that are at the top, you know, hiring developers, they want to hire a new developer and have them ship their new first feature as soon as possible, right? And when I mentioned the creating a subgraph, right, when we think about internal developer portals and teams that are creating templates, how you create new APIs within the organization, this is one of the things we focus on a lot, is how do we get a new GraphQL API to production in a self-service manner with no interactions? And it really comes down to platform teams. These are why things like Backstage have become so popular. You know, it's like one of the most top searched projects within inside the CNCF. Um, and it's because there's a lot of teams trying to think like this and, and how to get in that platform mindset, right? And these are kind of some of the pillars that are behind it, right? Self-service, what's the paved road? I think about that all the time. Like if I was doing open telemetry, I should just be able to start up this template thing and then whatever I need observability wise should just be there available for me. I shouldn't need to have to integrate more stuff into my template to get stuff working out of the box, right? And that makes time to value faster. It means there's less things I have to worry about when I'm getting started, right? And everyone has the same cohesion. We're all using the same tools, those standards that get put in place. Uh, most of the times at companies that I see adopting GraphQL, they end up picking two or three different languages of what they support inside of there. And that's part of that paved road, but also with some opinions in there. Like, we're a .NET Java shop, so we do these two. Um, and then, you know, every now and then there's a couple languages that people are like, ah, I wish we didn't have to support that one. But just like everything these days, supports all the languages, right? So for uh, whatever language you're working in, there's a GraphQL server library that supports, you know, whatever world you're in. Now, I talked a little bit about, you know, creating a new subgraph and this architecture, but one thing I didn't really talk about is like, how do you even bring those things together? Like I just talked about making a bunch of GraphQL microservices, then we have this thing that you know, routes across them, but like, how does any of that work? What's actually going on there? So let's, let's take a look. So what I have on the screen is uh, a couple things. I, I have some schema files in here. I have this router, uh, which is a binary inside of there. And then I have a YAML file. Um, so there's two things I'm going to be using. And uh, I'll pull them up here. Um, so we have Rover. Uh, this is our CLI uh, for kind of interacting with how we're going to compose multiple GraphQL APIs together. Um, it's uh, built in Rust. It's a simple binary that you can just install with this uh, single um, command. Uh, and then we also have our router. Uh, so I mentioned a graph router. There are other companies out there, the Guild, Wondergraph, uh, Hasura, that they have graph routers that route across multiple GraphQL APIs as well. Um, the Apollo router is like ours of that. So um, that's what that little router binary is in that VS Code folder. So the first thing I want to do is we, we have a couple schemas, right? Um, so I have products, orders, and customers here. And I want to compose those together and bring them together. Right here we have this YAML file. And it's got a couple things inside of it. One, it has the version of federation. So the version we're going to be using to bring things together. Federation is the process of composing together those multiple GraphQL microservices. And then we have the subgraphs. So we have our products, our orders. It has a URL for where it's routing. Those are obviously fake URLs, but uh, that's where the graph router would be routing that traffic. And then notice that it also has schema and it's pointing at a file. Um, you can have that point at a URL. Um, I'm just having a file to point at it locally because I didn't want to bring too much into the mix here. But there's a couple options in there. But uh, what we're doing is we're taking those schemas and we're composing them together. Um, so there's a command, rover super graph compose. This is what is going to compose together multiple GraphQL APIs. And all we have to do is provide it that config. All right, so we have that super graph YAML. We're pointing at that. Um, we have products, orders. I have customers commented out. What that does is that composes everything and gives us the output. So this is the composed schema of all of those pieces together. Uh, we can pipe that into a little GraphQL file so we can actually view it locally. And inside of here, this is essentially the machine-readable 
GraphQL artifact for the graph router. This contains all the information, all the metadata of those multiple graphs. What fields do they own? What types do they own? What are those connections, those relationships? This artifact is what you would be providing to a graph router. So we have our router binary. There's a lot of things inside of here. If you did help, you can see all the different uh, options and items in here. Um, but we have to provide it a super graph, and that's that GraphQL artifact that we just had. And there's a couple quick commands that I want to show you all about that I think is really great. And this is where things start to come very nicely in a self-service manner. So one, there's a dev mode for the router. This turns everything on to some nice little halves of being able to see you know, our logging, a sandbox environment that we can play in. And there's also this hot reload feature. That's going to be some magic that's inside of there. So we're starting up the router. We're pointing at our GraphQL file, dev hot reload. So a bunch of stuff just popped up on the screen. It's running in the background. We can go to our GraphQL endpoint. Here we are. This is our sandboxed environment right now that's all running locally. So the router running in dev mode gives you, we call it Apollo Explorer sandbox. And you have all these things in here of what you can start searching for. Now, here's where it gets really cool, right? We just composed multiple GraphQL APIs together, gave it to a router. Router can start executing traffic across those and everything. But what happens when we want to have a new API or change that or what's going on? The router with the hot reload function now gives us the ability to essentially point at that file. And whenever that file changes, it can now handle that traffic for us and actually can handle the load of the incoming traffic off that old configuration and start routing new traffic based off of that new configuration. So let's just notice over here in the fields. And one of the things we're going to do is we're just going to open up a new terminal window. And let's uncomment this customers. We're going to do that same rover supergraph compose. Ooh, that's, that's not how you right super yeah there we go okay and then we're going to pipe that back into that same file All right so it just did that notice how these fields over here just magically popped up it was it was really subtle it was really subtle uh, just to show you again i'll comment that out we'll recompose that and watch they're going to disappear they disappear I didn't, I didn't restart the router. I didn't do anything. And actually, if we look back at that terminal, you'll notice this reload configuration happens. Right? So what we have now are the basic building blocks where we can actually have a router, let's say in our Kubernetes cluster or something like that, and we can be creating new services inside of our cluster, having those be shipped into production without having to make any changes to our router's configuration. Right? If you think about, I need to expose um, a new REST API or a new service inside of my cluster, there's some, some Kubernetes configuration. There's some various steps that you have to take inside of this. Those actually disappear now. Right? Now we're talking about how do we have a pipeline that delivers updates to these schemas. So for example, when you use the subgraph templates, every single one of those has a GitHub action that is syncing this schema into a registry. And this would be something that you would want to be doing on your end, right? Everyone registering the capabilities they have. I see a question. Yes. What happens if the Great question. Just for the video, question popped up. What happens if with the router, with the traffic that's in flight? that's coming on, right? So one of these hot reload updates that happened. All the traffic that's in flight is going to be continued to be executed on that previous configuration. Any new traffic that's coming in after that hot reload will start being routed to that new configuration inside of there. So the router essentially holds on to both configurations for that short period of time and starts up a new queue for new traffic that's coming in to start executing that against um, that new configuration, whatever is inside of there. Great question. So this is also one of the reasons why so many teams have started to put this into their internal developer portals. OK, now we actually have a great story for self-service GraphQL API creation. 
right? Everyone, you want to get your stuff on the graph, get it into production, you just got to register it. Once you register it, everything's great. Now, of course, composition has a couple rules inside of it. You know, things may not compose together. Maybe two people name something the same. There are, of course, little conflicts like there. Um, but if you're doing that all in CI CD, right, that, that should fail inside of there. And, and we'll actually talk about some other protections and controls in, in place in a little bit. Um, so thinking back to that application that I had uh, showed a little earlier, I want to talk a little bit about that architecture. Right, because I had mentioned that like this graph router architecture, everything there. Um, so that application has two GraphQL APIs behind it. Um, one's for kind of the playback state, and then one is for all the queries. We want to actually split up the hosting of, you know, what is the stuff that's holding the state and what's holding more of just query operations inside of here. Um, and that's all uh, interacting with the Spotify REST API. Um, I, I love Railway. Uh, big shout out to Railway and their team. Um, we have uh, all of their, our stuff hosted on their infrastructure. It's a really great platform for just hosting things really easy with whatever Docker file you have. Um, and then we use uh, Netlify for the client application. Now, everything I showed you with that little Rover Supergraph Compose and that stuff, if you're wondering what does Apollo do, we sell tools that wrap all that stuff up for you. Right, if uh, a lot of our uh, community that you know is is building all this stuff out in the open, um, what they're doing today, you know, they have some S3 storage. That's where everyone's putting their schema files. They have some pipeline that when those items come in, they run this composition. If it succeeds, they put that into another S3 bucket location. That's what they point the router at, and then they just have like a second Docker process running with that router, um, and that's just fetching you know that update. Apollo, we have a schema registry, a pipeline that allows you to publish those updates into, allows you to check them, all of those things. So that application I was showing you, it's actually integrated with that schema pipeline, everything in there. We call it managed federation. Um, so that's kind of the separation between you know, our projects that we have out there um, in the open source, what we put out in the public versus kind of what our commercial product is. Um, now I mentioned the observability. Uh, this is actually one of the views from our product, but this is just really a visualization of the metrics coming through your graph. Um, the important thing is, you know, those fields, those individual fields inside of your graph, you should be able to actually count how many times was that field requested over a given period of time, right? Because when you think about adding a new feature, sometimes that's actually just like adding a new, uh, you know, item onto your JSON response. And, but how do you capture how many times that piece of the JSON response was requested? That's actually something you just get from GraphQL, because you can actually just say, for every request, if you're storing the operation body that's coming through, how many times was that field actually taken? Um, so you get operation usage, but also field level usage. Um, now, I mentioned GraphQL for all. Uh, subscriptions is one of those live stream things. I guess, actually, I should just show that real quick. Um, you know, inside of here, we'll uh, resume the music that's playing. And we'll actually show the playback state. So this is the subscription that's running live. So you can see the progress. That's the time that's changing inside of there, right? And when I pause that, you can see that subscription updates, right? So that's that real-time data. And the best part is, because it's just GraphQL, doesn't matter if I'm the iOS developer, or the web developer, whatever. This is what I mean when I say omni-channel strategy everyone gets access to that real-time data that's inside of there, which I think is really, really powerful. So that real-time experience and that data of what's providing, you know, when you look at the UI, that's all it really is, right? It's really, it's just that little time ticker that's ticking. And it's, it's such a small detail, but it's such an important detail. Right? How would we do this without that streaming aspect? We're going to just be polling it. Right? And you probably say, well, the song changes every second, so we poll every half a second. And that's how you just kind of make it work. Right? But as you scale, as you start getting further along, this is where these solutions start to uh, help a little bit more in that client developer experience. You had a question.
Ah, uh, yes. So uh, asking about the streaming for the back end part and everything. So fun little fact about this. Because we're using Spotify's REST API, for me to make the streaming work, I'm pulling their REST API for that data because they don't offer a streaming service. But uh, typically, what, what people will do when they're implementing their subscriptions on their side, um, you can implement subscriptions in any of your GraphQL APIs. I'm actually going to dig in the protocol in just a second. Um, but the important factor there with the uh, subscriptions and what you're putting there, it's really what you end up wanting to do. Most commonly, what I see is people have like some Kafka stream that's ingesting some pipeline of data from the business, and at certain event moments, that's where they want to fire that off. And they typically want to have some mechanism to have that Kafka stream feed into their subscriptions, which we have a protocol called HTTP callback, which I'm going to dig into in actually just a couple slides, and we'll, we'll use that as an example. Um, now, one thing I also want to note, you know, the information here is just the time that's changing, but when the song changes, that's when we need to have that data get updated. Um, one of the things the graph router does is it takes that incoming request, and for every incoming request, it creates a query plan. What is the explanation, or what is the data I'm going to need to get for that? I think of this as like, kind of like SQL explain, but for GraphQL. Um, and if we have a subscription, it actually can be where the subscription is being triggered from one of our GraphQL services, and then the router actually has to go to maybe another GraphQL service to fetch some updated data, right? Maybe it's like the information about the track details. So subscriptions, that real-time data, can actually be federated across multiple APIs within your organization, right? So now you can actually have a world where your Kafka stream is saying, an event happened for this ID object, and then the router says, that happened for this object? All right, now I need to go over to this service and get the updated object of this ID or whatever that entity domain is. Now, let's get into that real-time aspect. Um, so you know, one of the things about going to GraphQL is, is you start getting all the benefits of what comes along with that specification. And uh, really, GraphQL has been kind of pushing the boundaries in this space, um, definitely more recently. Uh, we've traditionally had WebSockets. You know, there's GraphQL WebSockets, GraphQL Transport WebSockets. Um, these are two common implementations that are used in GraphQL um, for supporting subscriptions and, and streaming. It's uh, you know, basic PubSub mechanism that if you want to plug in you know, whatever PubSub uh, you want. Redis is another common one that people use. Um, but most recently, one of the things we advanced was uh, HTTP callback. Um, another is uh, server-side events that are being pushed into this real-time subscription space. And what's really cool about this is this starts to uh, give us a lot better options, especially at scale. I mean, we all know WebSockets get really hard to scale, like especially when you get to some, some pretty crazy scale. And this is why queue mechanisms, enterprise service grade buses uh, all became a thing. Uh, now, with HP callback protocol, essentially the way this works, um, the subscription from the client side is all the same, but when the router is going to talk to a downstream GraphQL server, it's actually going to register the subscription with a callback URL over HTTP along with a verifier. Whenever that subgraph gets new data, when it has an event that it needs to report, it's going to use that callback URL to actually send that new data to the router with that verification. The router will be able to sign that, verify that it's coming from the trusted source, and then figure out what it's got to do next, which may be go out to other GraphQL APIs, get new updated, and return that to the client. That's that federated subscriptions. And the best part about this, I've been talking a lot about this router and everything. Uh, we like to call it the standard router binary, uh, but it's just you know the binary in the current form it's in. Um, it's also available as a Docker image, um, but you can actually configure that with some YAML, uh, and this is one of the ways you'd be configuring subscriptions in that router. And you can support all of these protocols. You could actually have one of your GraphQL servers support WebSockets and another one support HTTP callback protocol, and that's totally fine, right? The subscriptions are in whatever flavor you want. It's just some router configuration. Now, one of the other aspects that I think is really important about GraphQL is kind of how it changes some of these stories. So progressive loading, you know, having your website, your application, the time to interaction as fast as possible. That's what everyone wants right now. And the amount of times I've gotten 
or had stories with people about a feature request to have some data separated or a new API created so I can progressively load this data. It's like really common. And when you look at it, you know, that UI we're showing, maybe someone's like, hey, those top tracks, we don't need to show those top tracks for people to start interacting with the application. So I want to progressively load that portion of the data. Well, it's actually a lot of client code to you know, progressively load that one little aspect. And you start getting into patterns of how we should do this inside the website, and how should we do this in the mobile application. It becomes a world where now that whole promise of GraphQL for all, everyone just gets GraphQL, is starting to break apart. Now we have a bunch of clients that are writing this you know, logic to progressively load this data inside of there. And you can see this is that same operation in here. This is that query plan. It's just going to fetch into that one graph. But we want to progressively load that data. And it should be simple. Um, so GraphQL has actually introduced uh, a new uh, directive called at defer, which allows the client developers to add metadata into their operation that can hint to a graph router to understand this. So a client developer can say, hey, defer that data. I don't need that loaded. Load it to me when it's ready. So you can see we just add little at defer on that track fragment. And what the router is able to do is actually able to generate a new query plan based off of that information. Right? And you can see that it's actually now chunking into two different requests. So the router is able to understand, OK, you don't care about that data right now. I'm going to split them in two requests so I can give you the data you do care about as fast as possible. And if you look at this, I don't have them highlighted, but the total response for this operation took about 101 milliseconds. But you can see this first chunk, that actually only took 26 milliseconds. Right? So now, if you start thinking about this, so I'm a back-end developer. If you ever got requests of having to create a new API because of this progressive loading scenario, you don't have to do that anymore. You can actually use at defer for those scenarios. And, and it, it seems like magic, because it kind of is. But what's happening is, instead of us now having to write code, right? this is that little finite amount of code I'm talking about that you're writing to fetch data from different APIs, it's now coming in the form of a generated query plan that is now able to intelligently understand, I can chunk these into two response and feed the second set of data when it's available. Right? So that time interaction is less. Now, all this doesn't come for free, right? One of the things we should talk about is what's the elephant in the room? It's security. Everyone says, OK, GraphQL. What are these new attack domains I have to deal with? What are the things I don't know? Come on. Like, I just got everything together with REST. You know, we're moved to Kubernetes. Now there's all these other things, right? Security, security, security. It'll always be the thing. And don't get me wrong, there's things in GraphQL. Like with any technology, there's always going to be security concerns and risks. But just like I was mentioning at the spec at the beginning of my talk, GraphQL has matured a lot. It's been battle tested in the industry. You know, Netflix, um, Expedia, Intuit, you know, these companies that are using a lot of the technologies you use today and everything, they've chose GraphQL as one of their standards inside of there. You can see it in the talks they give, whether it's at GraphQL Summit, GraphQL Conf, KubeCon, API world, they're all over the place. Um, there's a couple things that I think are important for everyone to, to think about in here. One of the big differences of between GraphQL and REST is you now just have this one GraphQL endpoint. Everything flows through there, right? That is an opportunity for strength in your security. And one of the things that I always recommend and one of the most important things that a lot of uh, people put in is how do you start thinking about authentication in your graph? This is kind of the holy grail that a lot of teams ask about. We want to be able to make it where authentication is just baked into the graph. Um, one of the things that was introduced in uh, Apollo Federation 2.5 was the at authenticated directive along with at requires scope and um, at policy, which basically describes a semantic for a graph router to take an incoming request, reach out to an external process to get those scopes, those permissions, and those policies of what that user has, and then actually strip down the query plan based off of what they have access to. Right? So the query plan will actually be reduced 
based off of whatever these directives and metadata is inside of there. Right, so this now starts giving us that control of we're not sending any requests to downstream subgraphs for things that people have access to. That's, that's what everyone wants. The other one, which I think is extremely important, especially if you only have internal traffic, you know all your internal developers, right? Like you know the teams, essentially, right? They all work at the company. We should create, we should keep a list. Let's keep a list of what are all the things everyone's doing, right? Like, that, that makes sense. Let's, let's keep a list. And it's important because this list, these are the operations of like what our production traffic is actually running. And by keeping that list, that gives us an opportunity for a couple things. One, we can start optimizing our requests based off of specific operation shapes. Or two, we can create a safe list. If we keep a list of all the operations our developers have, well, now we can create an, op an operation safe list and we can actually lock our graph router to only send traffic that's pre-registered. So now similar to how we have a self-service motion for how developers can contribute capabilities to the graph, we also can have a self-service motion where developers can consume the graph. You wanna have your thing run in production? Well, you gotta register it first. That way if something happens, we know who to come talk to, right? Like, it makes sense. I'd also say persisted queries is one of the number one things I see used in almost every enterprise. Uh, it's, 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 it's used almost everywhere. Um, one of the other things to think about, we have an operation, right? People can write whatever fields they want, and that seems kind of scary at first, right? Like, I, I want to know what you're going to run before you just start running things. Like, before, I, we had an SLA. We had a great contract. As long as I stayed in my guidelines, we had no problems. But now you're telling me you can just run any operation you want? Get out of here. Like, no. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. This is where operation limits. And you, you definitely want to give developers flexibility, but you also want to put some guardrails on, right? So one is thinking about what is the depth? How many fields can people select in to a graph, right? This is going to be dependent on your use case, your scenario. Right? But that's something you want to think about. You can kind of see the little graphic of like counting over. There's also root fields. How many root fields should you let people query inside of it? Usually those root fields are entry points into getting a lot of data, especially when you have you know, data teams that are trying to pull very large swaths of data. You know, maybe that's something you want to consider of, of uh, having some limits inside of there. There's also aliases. So people can write aliases so things show up differently in their client application. Maybe you want to limit that or even the height. How much can someone select from like a single given type inside of there? Um, these are all part of li uh, operation limits um, that are uh, available in the graph router. It's just configuration. Uh, but these are also just common things that are, are out there in the industry that, that people have put out there. So one thing I want you to leave today with is GraphQL does make your APIs better. There's, there's a little bit of work to get there, but it is worth it. Um, it makes your observability story stronger, makes you shipping application delivery updates faster, and it really powers that omni-channel strategy. And the other thing I want you to remember is you can do this today. It's not that big of a lift. You can actually just bolt on GraphQL into your current existing app. If you've got a, a Java Spring Boot app, you've got a .NET ASP um, API, you can actually add on the GraphQL packages to those server libraries and just start exposing a little portion of a schema, right? Maybe take one of those screens from your website, try converting that portion to GraphQL, and that's the start of your incremental journey of how do we do a proof of concept and, and play around with this. And if you want to learn more, uh, I mentioned Odyssey. Or that's our tutorial platform. I think that is one of the best places to go and learn about GraphQL. We actually just created a Java and a .NET backend course inside of there. So if you were, hey, I'm a Java Spring Boot developer, there's a great tutorial class inside of there, certifications, and we're going to be building more and putting stuff out there. Um, there's also, of course, the client side of things, React front end and everything there. Well, with that, I want to say thank you to everyone. Uh, we do have some time left. Um, I'm going to be around also, so I'm here for questions. I see a question right there. Thank you so much for that presentation. We have about five minutes for questions. Please raise your hand if you have a question. I'll bring the mic. Hi. 
Hi, I may, I may have come in late. Uh, you used the phrase, the term graph many times. Can you define it, please? Ah, define the word graph. Yeah, this is definitely one of those areas where like everyone calls graph. I think when I define graph, I think of graph as your API's graph. The graph of your APIs is more of what I'm referring to in that infrastructure, that architecture right there. Um, and specifically, the schema of your APIs inside of that. I think we Do have we have any more questions? Feel free to raise your hand. I got one right here. Yeah, thanks. Great talk. Uh, for the GraphQL subscription, could you share more of the pros and cons using uh, HTTP? callbacks versus WebSocket? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so one of the big things is going to be about resources. Um, there's no long-lived connection between the router and your downstream subgraphs uh, when you are using callback subscriptions versus WebSockets. So that's one of the big changes there. From the client developer aspect to the router, there's no differences between which protocol. It's really just the router to those subgraphs. So that's one. Two, which is what I find much more interesting is it gives a pattern where instead of having the router keeping a connection open with your GraphQL API and getting that stream of events, you can actually have a mechanism, because it's a protocol that just describes you know, the heartbeat interval, the aspects of how those requests are happening, you can actually create a bespoke service that is responsible for all of these updates through like a queuing mechanism that actually isn't a GraphQL API at all. Right, because now the subscription is really just an event of like, this is the stuff I care about and I need you to tell me about it. And then you just need to have a mechanism doing that. That's where actually I've seen some customers take Kafka streams and they basically have a bespoke service that anytime the Kafka stream comes in, they store the identifier that comes in from the incoming subscription and they just have their Kafka stream basically send updates to the router based off of that ID. Um, and what verifier is stored in there. So it gives you more flexibility and options of what you might want to architect internally, where if you use the WebSockets protocol, you're going to have to have a GraphQL server. You're going to have to implement it through the schema. And it's going to be very structured of what you have. Um, you can still follow that with callback protocol, of course. Like, that's what I did. But because of that protocol, you can have a lot more flexibility, like putting a queue behind it, for example. I uh, got a question right here. All right, where? Oh, there you are. Uh, it should be a good question. So in the, in the subgraph section, you have given a, a GraphQL that ha explains about the schema or contract. Yep. And also you have the URLs there. Uh, is it like a good idea like to separate the environment specific things from the contract so we can deploy them to different environments? Yeah, that yeah, that's a great question. So it's actually very common. Um, so those directives you saw uh, inside of the schema, uh, in GraphQL, you can create whatever directives you want. That's just part of GraphQL. A lot of companies will create directives that actually change the schema, the representation of it. And the most common example is pre-prod. So there's a lot of teams where they actually have a pre-prod directive. And essentially taking that directive off is what gets it into the production schema. So they have a pre-prod environment, a prod environment. The pre-prod is identical to the prod environment. The only difference is they have a, a step during their build script that essentially visits the schema and removes all of the pre-prod directive fields and types from the schema, and that's what gets run in production. All right. That's about all we have for time. Uh, thank you again for visiting, and I hope you enjoyed GraphQL. Make sure API is better. The Revolution in Efficiency and Real-Time Performance by Michael Watson. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. It's very humbling. Uh, and I'll be around to answer more questions. I saw a couple.